Thank you. That was, that was really interesting. I think we're very lucky to um, have actually had some building uh, entertainment. So that will form the basis of what will happen next, which I hope will be extremely interactive. So the structure of this, um, it's uh, sadly not all of our panel members can actually be here in person. So some of us will be reading statements. But what we'd like to do is basically um, everyone who is here today has something useful to say about women in power in archaeology. <laughs> um, so, so what we're going to do is actually we're going to invite all of our panel members to give just a very short introduction because this session is meant to be not the normal feminism and archaeology session that you have all been to 500 times um, where we, we talk about you know the horrible things and we talk about you know some of the theory. This session is meant to get actual action points onto a piece of paper. This section is meant to highlight things that we think can be actioned and should be actioned. So before that we'll go, everyone will be invited to come up. I think a couple of slides with a couple of statements. We're going to have everyone come and say their piece. The, this panel has a vast amount of experience and is able to summarize that in a lot of the situation for archaeology in the UK. So we're going to take advantage of that. Um, the scribbling team here will be taking notes on the problems we identify, the actions we identify, and that is going to form the basis for our later discussion. And I would very much like to invite the audience to contribute. So after the statements, uh, we'll take a short break, and then we will go to a full panel mode where everyone will have a chance to respond to the, the problems that were raised. I would very much invite the audience to, if you have a point you'd like to add or feel hasn't been addressed, please do just raise your hand. We will have a roving mic, and I will try to see you. Um, so I think we will go ahead and start with some statements. Uh, I am, um, well, I will. I will. Uh, yeah, you can, you can have this if you want, or uh, I can, or, yeah. Um, so just, just as an introduction, um, so mm -hmm. I'm Brennan Hassett, uh, I'm here on behalf of Trailblazers, and also just myself, um, right. uh, and um, so I, I will be uh, chairing some of the more aggressive part of the session here, with the help of uh, Becky Bright Snipes, and Susanna Pilar-Birch, who are also here. And then, um, so we unfortunately have some people who are not able to attend, one of whom is Hannah Cutler. And um, she's, um, she's very kindly provided us a statement um, which uh, Becky has offered to read out while I put out some of the slides. <laughs> yeah, uh, you don't have to hold the button down, just hold it close to you. Uh, yes, okay. Um, so, yes, uh, we invited Hannah and to. Um, to contribute. Uh, she is an archaeological officer and she specializes in Paleolithic uh, Mesolithic. She works for Suffolk County Council and our control service. Um, and we, we asked Hannah to uh, contribute because she's a trans woman and we really wanted to make sure that um, uh, trans people's perspectives and binary perspectives are included because, um, as uh, many people might know, there are some and the slight issues uh, in feminist circles about whether or not that's appropriate, we believe it is. Um, so, Hannah Sacred uh, reads my background. Thank you for this opportunity to contribute. Apologies, I can't be with you. I'm currently an HER officer completing a project enhancing Paleolithic and Mesolithic records for Suffolk, funded by Historic England. I've been a development control officer, a site assistant, and a postgrad student. I transitioned almost a decade ago while after taking my PhD at the University of Cambridge. When I went back to commercial digging post-PhD, I eventually ended up working for the same commercial field union which I previously worked for. Therefore, my trans status was always known. My managers didn't need to bring it up because it wasn't relevant. The only time it was was when I needed time off for surgery and light duties when I came back to work. I am treated no differently from any other member of my team, which is as it should be. This may have something to do with archaeologists generally being an amiable sort. Um, and the uh, next section, bad experiences. Whilst I have not had that many bad experiences while working, I have a couple of examples which illustrate the type of things that can occur, either around the process of social or medical transition, but also for people for whom the big changes are behind them, 
and are already getting on with their life and their career. So the first example, while studying about a year or so after I transitioned, a kind librarian pointed out to me that despite my name change, the university library system always showed my old name to whoever was looking. And essentially this was outing me every time without my consent and whoever looked at the system. Getting this change was really complicated at the time, although I think it's improved since. Um, although I'd technically already done it through the central registration. There was no balance in this, it was just how the systems and bureaucracy had not been set up to deal with this kind of thing. Um, similar issues could be predicted um, in other organisations, and if they're noticed, then they should be dealt with quickly. Example number two. Um, years later, while digging, I was talking to a colleague, and she mentioned, after I had brought up my transition, that a colleague who had since left, but who had known me before I transitioned, went around mentioning my trans status to all the newer staff. This kind of gossip was wrong, um, and no different to gossip about other sensitive subjects, and had I known at the time, I would have complained. Issues such as this, and bullying, can be covered by staff codes of conduct and procedures, depending on how severe they are. The Equalities Act of 2010 is the basis of anti-discrimination law and covers most of the basis. Staff can be educated to know what is inappropriate, so that hopefully a quick correction by a colleague informally prevents others being told and things escalating. Um, gender Recognition. The Gender Recognition Act 2004 allows trans people to change their legal gender. The Act may or may not be reformed soon. Um, almost all gender marker and name changes do not require this, despite misinformed people thinking otherwise. In 2011, my university would not change my official gender marker without a gender recognition certificate, the GRC. Employers should not ask for a person's GRC, and it should never be a precondition for transitioning at work. It is illegal to ask. Without a GRC, this can be grounds to sue in civil court. With a GRC, outing is a criminal offence. For various reasons, gender recognition can be difficult to retain. It doesn't recognise non-binary people. I haven't bothered. I don't want to go on a government list of trans people and pay £100 for the privilege of a faceless bureaucrat deciding whether I'm female. Um, she has some tips uh, for cisgender, which is uh, non-transgender people, staff, colleagues, managers. Respect pronouns. Yes, this is a big deal. Don't out people without their consent. Experiences and thus needs do vary, so please speak to your trans employee. Mental health issues for transitioning people can be serious due to stress associated with anxiety, difficulty getting medical help, etc. Be mindful. Trans women still experience sexism and misogyny. I never had my experience or qualifications questioned or were spoken over to at meetings like I have been since transitioning. <laughs> um, check your sources if you're creating procedures documentation. There are well funded anti trans groups and they often publish guides um, in bed commas which can on face value appear reasonable. Don't try and reinvent the wheel. There are numerous good guides out there and she's provided some links for those so we can put those in uh, the documentation. Uh, for example, when assisting Suffolk County Council HR department in writing the policy for trans employees, uh, the HR team were all cisgender. They were worried because they said they had no idea how to deal with um, doing employee leave for surgery as they thought it hadn't been dealt with. I told them um, that they had dealt with someone which was me and it was no different to other staff having time off for other medical reasons. Um, commercial archaeology. I can't think of too many things that trans women require that cis women don't also require that are specific to commercial archaeology. Field archaeology is no different for trans women. The only thing I can think of is gender presentation, which can be an issue for anyone at any time, but might be more pronounced at the start of transition. It can be hard to perform normative femininity wearing digging clothes and PPE. Presentation, whether normative or not, is irrelevant to how trans women should be treated and whether their gender is respected. And she's provided um, a number of links um, uh, guides for employees, um, uh, toolkits and things, so we will make sure that those are um, provided uh, when we put our resource together. So, um, yeah, I'd just like to thank her very much for providing her personal experience. And who's next? <laughs> yeah, Hannah Cutler.
Yeah. Oh, sorry, yes, there's Hannah Kahn. That's me. And I'm here. And then Hannah Kahn, who sadly could not make it today. Yeah, there she is. So she's, sorry, at the bottom. Um, yes, so uh, we do have um, some statements from Penny Foreman, but I think we might um, go actually to Hannah Cobb, who um, is, yeah, sort of can, can double up <laughs> with the Steeper uh, thing. So your presentation is on there. And I'll leave the hands on my design. Yeah, we can, we can see how much we overlap. So, yes. Well, I might be, I might be really well with the microphone. If I project, can you hear me? Do, do I need a microphone? I, I think the microphone is better just in case anyone needs uh, Okay, so. fair enough. Uh, is this... Um, so, yeah. Uh, is this better? Yeah. 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 So I am creeping around behind everyone writing things on whiteboard in a menacing way. So you totally <laughs> menaced by that. That yeah. is what we're talking about in the second half of the section. So. All right. Um, so, hello. I'm Hannah Cobb. Uh, I uh, feel uncomfortable with a microphone in my hand. Uh, and uh, also, I chair the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, Equality and Diversity Group. Um, so the challenge that I want to talk about very briefly is the big one, that inequality is embedded in the structures of our profession. Oh, I can also hear my own voice out there. Um, um, so, uh, so uh, inequality is embedded in the structures of our profession. So um, he, uh, here's a slide that I've already massively overused this uh, this uh, tag um, and in general uh, but basically is a quick summary about the ways in which structural uh, inequality exists in the face of in, as a result of harassment discrimination explicit and implicit inequalities our profound lack of diversity as a profession and the various barriers to entry and progression that we have um, I want to um, uh, give you a, a, a personal example of some of the structural inequality that exists. Here is a personal example uh, from a student who did my course last year. They filled out their course unit information, uh, course unit feedback to tell me. Um, this module was made much harder than it needed to be due to Hannah only working three days a week and only answering her emails on those days. Um, I understand that Hannah has family commitments and large roles within and outside the university, and I don't blame her for that. But I do strongly believe that because of these commitments, she should not have been running the Doing Archaeology 2 course. Now, uh, that's a lovely example of structural inequality because these forms feed into the promotion process. Uh, so, uh, so that could be used if I ever make a promotion case. And also, um, if I don't run those, then I could never get promotion if I don't run courses. Uh, so, 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 and this is a student, I'm sure, who, who probably regards themselves probably as a feminist and everything. I don't think I had a bunch of students who were, who weren't woke. So this is how structural inequality is. And this is me just, you know, a privileged white cis woman moaning, really. Other structural inequalities are much more serious and um, I know we're just talking about women but this is intersectional uh, the, the inequalities that exist uh, uh, across the profession and that's just a few statistics um, and so this is all really uh, depressing and upsetting stuff but I want to try and think of some positive things because it's tag, I've got some quotes in from Rosie Brindotti, um, who says despair is not a project, affirmation is and also that anger and opposition are not enough. They need to be transformed into a power to act so as to become a constitutive force. This reflects the slides in the introduction. And I'm really grateful to be able to, to, to think through with you all some ways of doing this. The Equality and Diversity Group set about trying to do this in a series of different ways. And the thing that I think has been one of the most effective things in the long run uh, was the um, uh, cross-sector equality and diversity action meeting that we held in July last year. The British Women Archaeologists were there, there was people represented from across the sector, so people uh, like uh, the CEOs of uh, Wessex and Oxford's and big commercial units and Historic England were represented and um, uh, 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 local government and various third parties and academia as well. And um, what was brilliant in this meeting was Sarah May crystallising everything by giving an analogy that we need to have a culture change akin to the, the culture change that happened with health and safety that happened 
early, you know, 20 years ago, that we would never do anything bad, health and safety wise, and we certainly would report it, and we would try not to. And the same thing must happen for equality and diversity. And out of that then came cross sector consensus, which produced the uh, UK industry group statement, um, which you can find on CIFA's website. It's a, a very small. Uh, the crucial thing is that Sarah May's change of culture has appeared here. And um, the really crucial thing, I think, is here uh, that our organisations will therefore publish programmes of work in line with these commitments, uh, that people are, are ready to commit to take action on all of this. And that's great because that gives us an open door to push across the sector for change. And so in the last month, the um, uh, Equality and Diversity Group have sent, oops, no, what am I doing? Oh, oh, where's my slide? Um, oh, well, I'll, I'll relocate my slide. Um, I think that was the previous version of the slides that were attached to my PowerPoint. Ace. Yes. Ah, there we go, right. Um, so, uh, we sent uh, 10 suggested actions to diversify your workplace to all the registered organisations with CIFA. FAME are also going to send this out after uh, they've been busy videoing everything here. Uh, and, um, uh, and so this is going to go to all the registered organisations, all the members of FAME. So this is just 10 simple steps. There's a link, you can take a photo and look at them yourself if you want. I'm sorry I didn't print them out really, really well with me. But this means that there's um, space for collective action. So, the key challenge is the structural nature of equality, uh, inequality. Actions to address this is culture change in getting engendered by engaging the whole sector and pushing at the open door that the industry statement gives us. But one final thing, I think, is how can we push at that? And the crucial thing for me is through collective action. Not homogenising ourselves, because we all do different things brilliantly and we should all have our different voices, but we should all work together to amplify those voices. And so we've begun a conversation about having an equalities collective for archaeology and heritage. I think we still need to have more conversations about how that will work. And we'll certainly um, hopefully have funding for that from CIFA for the first event, perhaps FAME uh, for future things maybe. Uh, so, and Prospect, I think, said he didn't seem to think we'd put some funding in too. Um, so, hopefully, we will have some more conversations about that. And if you're interested, then please do feel free to uh, get in touch uh, if you would like to, to join that. So, in summary, our key challenge, well, my the key challenge I see is the structural nature of inequality. And the actions that I think we can take to address this are culture change across the whole sector, uh, engendered by engaging the whole sector pushing at the open door that the industry statement gives us and amplifying our voices and our activism through taking collective action, which I'm very pleased to be part of today. Thank you, thank you. Um, our presenters were warned to keep their statements very brief, so thank you very much. Um, um, I think, um, so, yeah. Whoever wants to go like next? I'll do a dance around the table. Can you go like that? I'll go this way. I, I will move a chair because I'm, I'm standing in the whiteboard now. But um, yes, do, do you have your slides? I don't have slides. Oh, you don't have slides? Yes. Ha ha ha. Maybe I don't have slides. <laughs> um, yes, sir. I'm Kate Hawkins. I'm a member of the Badger Respect team. Um, I'm also a fine specialist, pottery specialist at Archaeology South East. Um, and obviously the title of this session is Women and Power, and we're looking at the barriers to this in our sector, and I was thinking about women and power, and I was thinking, okay, I'm a woman, I've been working in commercial archaeology for 20 years or so, do I have power? Do I think I have more power now than I had when I started 20 years ago? I kind of, initially I thought, yeah, I do. And then I thought, no, I don't, I have more confidence that I think has come with experience of realising that actually everybody I work with is insecure and all struggling to work in a system that doesn't really support the vast majority of us. And um, in particular, um, in conversations with Kat Riggs, who's another member of the Badge Respect team, we were, talking, we were looking at um, our roles in archaeology and the gendering of roles within archaeology, within uh, commercial archaeology. 
And uh, she was talking about her partner who was kind of encouraged to go down a career route that wasn't necessarily the one of his choice, um, but the one that he was strongly advised to go down. And I was thinking as well about something Jenny Andrew from Prospect Union said this morning about the gendering of roles and the division that um, roots women away from positions of power. So I just want to sort of illustrate this point really by focusing on some of the recent conversations that have been involved with the conferences and both in the Respect and Mentoring Women in Archaeology and Heritage Facebook groups. Um, talking about the problems, and there are vast problems, we've heard a lot about it, this conference with women trying to maintain a career in field archaeology, um, and after this morning's session on gender um, in archaeology as well, in commercial archaeology, it seems to be a pattern that is prevalent across the whole of Europe. Um, but, um, yeah, looking at how women, when women are talking about how can they maintain a career and family commitments in archaeology, one of the routes that's often touted is you need to find specialism. Do a specialism, go into post-ex. So as a fine specialist, I'm speaking as well from personal experience and this shared sense of frustration that's come out with colleagues recently. Earlier this year, Jane Evans gave a paper at the 30th CIFA Fines Group Conference and she traced the career trajectories of three women who all started in fines work in the late 1980s. Among many of the points that she raised was that post ex particularly fines, you know, as I was saying, is on being touted as this obvious option if you want to combine career and family. But are we selling a false promise here to, um, to women? We've already heard about, I'm sure we will hear more about, the lack of representation of women in senior roles. Yet we also know that more women are entering the profession, more women are entering at university level. And some of the stats that were up by Penny earlier, I think it was about 60% or something, coming in to study archaeology. Um, and then in Hannah's slide, we saw that at MIFA level, within CIFA, only 33% of women have, have MIFA level. And women are certainly overrepresented in these specialist posts. So there's a survey of archaeological specialists undertaken by Kenny Aitchinson, 2016-17. Um, and that covers all archaeological specialisms, not just fine specialisms. And women there accounted for 55%. Um, we did a survey of the C for Fines group, and we found that it was around 65% or just over um, identified as female. So if we look, we take that women's roles are often undervalued in general. Our archaeological jobs dominated by women also paid less prestige within our profession, sort of form of not so unconscious bias within the workplace. Um, and we're talking about this and we think when you start at the beginning at university, how often is it that the fines hut is often viewed as female, you know, it's after all where the tea urn and the biscuits are located, but it's also where those who are too unwell or unruly to work on site are sent. So straight away, a young archaeologist's first experience of site work is a, is a kind of dismissive attitude already towards fines work, the emphasis being the field work is, is where it's at. Um, and I've also worked, I think, I think that attitude, sort of dismissive attitude, you see it carrying on in the commercial world because I've certainly worked at organisations where site staff have actually preferred to take annual leave <coughs> rather than go and work in fines when, when there's a lull in field work. Um, you also have the working pattern of specialists, many of whom work part time, and you've know, seen like Hannah's comments about her three day a week. And again, a specialist survey found that a third of specialists work part time. The finance group survey we found again that that was slightly higher. Um, and I've spoken to colleagues, a colleague before who, when she was on maternity leave, was a part time academic member of staff. I don't think employment law would allow this now. I hope not. But part of her hours were taken away while she was on maternity leave to create a full time post. And when she questioned it, her senior male colleagues told her they had to advertise a full time post to ensure they recruited somebody of suitable calibre. So, you know, the perceptions of part time work also, also plays into this. And also, when you work part time as a fine specialist, you're often told that you're not going to get the good sites necessarily. Um, expect you know, the, the sort of the drips and drabs and the, the smaller sites. And then that impacts on your publication record, but that's your key tool for proving your competency. There's also the stats from the archaeological surveys that show that in terms of charge out rates, those areas populated by women are also the lowest. So um, in the archaeology, in the survey of archaeological specialists, um, in the ranking of charge out rates, fines work came in at 10th, 
And uh, then it was illustration, and actually archives, which we know is another very female-dominated area, came in at the lowest with a charge at a rate of about £200 a day, I think. Um, it also showed that male specialists, on average, are charged at a higher rate of around £273 a day, female specialists around £217. And also, if you work part-time, you're also going to be charged out at a lower rate. Um, the correlation wasn't explicit in that report, but I suspect a lot of those part-time specialists are also female. And to come back to Jane's paper at the, the Fines Group conference, of those three women, one of the women left Fines work um, because she had a young family and at the time she couldn't make it work and it was just it was too complicated, but she still pines and she still misses you know, her engagement with the archaeological Fines. Another moved out of Fines after a much more varied career that gave her the background to go into management. The third is still a Fines specialist. And I think that's, that's part of the... The issue there if we're looking at taking women um, out and moving them from the roots that lead to, to management and power when you go into a fine specialism as well you're often deemed as having too narrow experience to take on those bigger management roles so you know are we are we sort of tipping our, our women into a into a compromise by saying get a specialism so you can maintain this work-life balance but at the same time you know, your career is maybe going to stop at that point. And for some, you know, for some women, they're, they're absolutely happy with that. But that, that's maybe not explicit or that's not really understood at the time. Um, I think there's a lot more that we can pull out of <laughs> what I've just been saying. Um, but I just want to keep it, condense it and keep it short. So I suppose the question is, you know, do we need to spend some time critically examining the importance and the value we place on different areas within the profession? You know, sort of properly evaluate this gendering of roles and look at that in you know the structural inequalities and um, yeah, basically that's my question <laughs> to you for the discussion later. Okay. You're in the back, right? Are Rachel, are you and Anne giving a statement together, or are you yes, separate? Yes. This one, and Anne will share. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I'll, I'll, I think I will do. We'll do. Um, I can have you form and then let you. Yeah, now that you're out of your chair, um, because we we have two. Uh, we have two statements actually from. Um, Bellamy Foreman, who wasn't able to be here, um, and as part of C5, Hannah Cobb will uh, read one, and then um, as part of um, Enabled Archaeology, uh, wait, which one? Enabled. Yep. Which one would you like to read? Um, well, mine was just the other right. one. So, there we go. So, sorry, Hannah has Enabled Archaeology, and Susie has the Women in Community Archaeology. So, um, Susie, if you want to start, and then Hannah will go. All right. I will try and find the slides. Oh, right. Oh, you want the mic. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, so yes, this is on behalf of Penelope Foreman. And so she's writing this paper from her perspective as a community archaeologist working in Wales on projects that are largely grant aid funded by CADU, a function of the Welsh government. And um, she wants to say that this is not representative of all community archaeologists. Um, but that the fragmented and loose collection of skills and roles that come under community and public archaeology means defining what we do is a difficult act in itself. And I'll just read from here. Uh, as a woman in community archaeology, I am, for once not, in a minority. Anecdotally, from experience in meetings, conferences, and networking with peers, those involved in the discipline are overwhelmingly female or female identified. This has led to some positives. No other time in my academic or professional career have I had such productive, positive, and constructive meetings and support. But as I will describe, it has also had significant drawbacks which impact on archaeology as a discipline, the communities we work with, and the professional and personal lives of community archaeologists. Our discipline is still plagued by dismissal from some quarters within archaeology as not proper archaeology. Because we don't dig full time, we don't teach solely at graduate level and above, and we don't write enough papers or contribute to enough research proposals. Our core skills are written off as soft, people skills, communication, negotiation, diplomacy. All very women's work. Coordinating volunteers, organizing facilities, engaging families, and speaking to diverse but generally non-specialist audiences. And yet, community archaeology is at the very forefront of what archaeology should be absolutely focusing on in order to ensure its survival, 
studying the effects of archaeology on community and an individual well-being, looking at social and economic impacts of our work on the regions we work in, establishing how archaeology and heritage feed into placemaking, identity construction, and other contemporary social issues. It's the perfect testing ground for decolonizing work that must happen to keep archaeology relevant, engaging, and importantly, more inclusive and accessible. Without work to engage and educate the public, how will future generations want to become archaeologists, want to support heritage projects, and want to influence policy and practice when they are in power or in the workforce in 5, 10, and 20 years' time? The discipline fails into being, falls into being institutionalized, that is governed by demands of legislation or policy that leads to demands of funders and partnership organizations. So it's about time the role of community archaeology within this framework is recognized. Secondly, community archaeologists also end up doing emotional labor and overtime in a way that is very different, but parallel to similar demands upon others within commercial and academic departments. Community archaeologists are expected and often required to, by project designs, to work with individuals that are vulnerable or who have current physical or mental health issues or who are socially isolated. All of these people benefit incredibly from archaeology, but working with them requires a significant skill set and takes an emotional toll that I can guarantee very few community archaeologists are trained to deal with in any substantial way. Though some workplaces offer mental health first aid training, this is but a sticking plaster on what will become a more significant problem as more and more projects are framed as a way to tackle social and well-being issues as their core outcome. These both feed into a very core issue, poorly paid roles and a lack of progression. Without a recognized definition of what community archaeology is and does, it does not get professional recognition required to establish pay grades or promotion groups. When opportunities are few and departments are small, there are very limited options for moving up, leaving women stagnated in low pay grade roles because it is rewarding and interesting and good work, but not professionally recognized enough to push SIFA uh, and command rates of courting pay. Solutions. There is some light. The SIFA Voluntary and Community Group have been working on both analysis of community archaeologists and related roles to construct both industry standards for what these jobs should require and for what pay grades they should offer. Haley Pryor has been doing excellent work on this, and we hope to release findings early in 2020. We are also in the final stages of editing new competency matrix for community archaeology, which again will go into press in the first half of 2020, which even if you're not a SIPA member, will provide an excellent way to plan CPD, evaluate your current roles, opportunities, and drawbacks, and where to focus in order to push for more recognition of your hard and vital work. I would also implore anyone working in community archaeology to publish as much as possible and open access where feasible to get as much of our work cited and into the cycle of impact. Finally, share the work of your peers and colleagues. Give people a signal boost inside and outside of the standard journals and publications. Sometimes the jink of recognition is all it takes to boost morale enough to keep going. So that's on behalf of Penelope Foreman. Let's just say it again. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll hear from Penelope uh, again, uh, with a different hat. but uh, with a different hat on. Yeah, it's a shame she's here because she's awesome as well. Um, uh, okay, so uh, so this is Penny's statement about enabled women in archaeology. And this is all very uh, nice to start with. Um, I want to start this paper saying that while I was very honoured to be invited to speak about the issues facing enabled women in archaeology, I want to make it very clear that I speak from my own experience only, and that I'm not one of the trustees or board of the AF. Just to now step out for a second, I am Ham Cobb, one of the trustees of the AF, so I can answer some questions to it and so on. But Penny is giving this, and it's Penny's voice that I'm speaking in. Um, Penny says, Every enabled archaeologist has a different lived experience, has different challenges, different triumphs, and different ways of being an archaeologist. I want to give an overview of some of the main issues and some ways I feel action can be taken. Teresa O'Mahony is a woman who should be on this panel right now. Um, she, was, she was there for me when I had my diagnosis last year, and she was there for me <coughs> because of her tireless and determined fight to drag archaeology into a more inclusive, less discriminatory discipline. I would attempt to convey a fraction of her energy here. <sighs> So, I'll start by saying that the way disability or health issues is framed in discourse around access to archaeology is heavily medicalised. What I mean by the medical versus social model is this. 
The medical model states that it is a condition that limits a person's access to archaeology. The social model states that it is society's attitudes towards and treatment of us is what limits us. What the EAF and Theresa knew painfully well is that we need to move towards the social model to affect real change. The discipline needs to take responsibility, hold up its hands to the way it overtly and covertly discriminated against the enabled archaeologists, and take steps to removing barriers to participation. Though we recognise this need, we are held back by the fear. Fear, I have given a capital F, because it's overwhelming and multifaceted, and something I think unifies us as enabled archaeologists. It's fear of the reaction of our colleagues and peers and volunteers when they know about our health status or about our diagnoses or when our necessary or our necessary accommodations. It's the fear of taking a day off, even when our bodies are at the very limit, because the next competency hearing could see us unemployed in a very frightening economic world. It's fear of even disclosing our health when we apply for a job or receive a diagnosis, because it could put us out of the running and try to use expensive to bring to bear. It's the fear of our own bodies not being capable tomorrow of what they could do today. It's the fear of admitting that. It's the fear that one day we won't be able to carry on. And where do we go from here? With the loss of Teresa, we lost our anchor in the world. And that is true. The EAF endures, but I am sure I'm not alone in thinking we don't have that focus on the strength and power that she embodied. So for my first solution, I implore you not to let her work be abandoned. Volunteer to keep EAF's work going, to get the projects Teresa began and fought so hard for the support and recognition they deserve. Donate if you are able, time or money, and share their work as much as possible. Sessions like this one often leave you with a drive to do something, so let this be your something. With that in mind, I come to my next point, the need for challenge. This point will make certain sectors of our discipline uncomfortable may even result in responses that are angry and dismissive. Because people do not like to be called out on their privilege for the status quo that benefits them. In quotation marks, when you are accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. Oh, close quotation. Challenge your workplace, institution, department. Don't just write an access statement that says, we tried and wrap, didn't work, at least we tried. Ask how they're consulted with, how they, they consulted with enabled individuals. Ask what consultants they've employed to do this, rather than relying on the free labour of enabled individuals. Ask what adjustments they'll be making this year, next year, over the next three years. Ask how they make accommodations for neurodiverse individuals in the field. Ask where their fridge for medication is. Ask where their nearest changing place is accessible bathroom on campus is. Ask where the quiet space is. Don't let up and don't let people off the hook. 20 years ago, putting in a ramp into a university department was almost revolutionary. Now it's simply not good enough. Along similar lines, I also implore you to help normalise enabled archaeologists. When I use the word normalise, I mean in the sense that it becomes not something to note or be surprised about when enabled archaeologists are in the field or speaking at a conference, or that application forms ask for access requirements, or that equipment is available to make volunteering or working on site accessible to as broad a range of people as possible. If you feel able, share your experience. The good, the bad, and the ugly. So other people going through the same know they are not alone. Let people within and without the discipline see that the different ways enable archaeologists experience archaeology. Let conversations be had uh, that can be difficult, can be challenging, but above all can inform, and educate, and spark change. If you don't feel able to share, then you absolutely never should feel obligated to do so. Boost the voices of others that are telling their stories. If you are in a position of privilege and influence, use it. Get the voices of enabled archaeologists out there and help us defeat the fear. That's a penny. Okay. I guess I could just really quickly to say, if people want to read more about Teresa, there's a memory board at the entrance of the, uh, of the, the uh, where the coffee is. Do, do you want um, to just uh, briefly uh, explain to Teresa uh, about enabled archaeology for people who may not know in the room? Um, uh, Teresa founded the Enabled Archaeology Foundation, and uh, well, it really exists at the moment as the Enabled Archaeology Group on Facebook. It's a, I think it's a closed group, but it's, it's there to, to, to join in and, uh, and provide some support. The Enabled Archaeology Foundation was in the process of formalising sort of, and, and actualising Teresa's ambitions uh, at the point where she 
die. Uh, and, and so we as trustees are in the process of, of, of talking about how we move forward. Uh, and so it's one of these kind of watch this spaces in terms of um, uh, 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 us communicating what, what it needs. What it needs is, is to help this much either. Unfortunately, because she was an absolute powerhouse and she took no nonsense and she was ready to put herself out there and fight these fights. So it, it needs it needs a mother to use that. So you know, if anyone else wants to wants to step into those massive shoes, then that would be really amazing. So we'll we'll see you later. Thanks very much. So I think now we have the uh chance to hear from Rachel Peck. Um do you want to come out slides? We do have two mics. Oh, shit. The second right. Where your slides are. Wow. Okay. Fun. Fun. Okay, you all hear me, I've got a bit of a sexy voice on today. <laughs> Alright, so uh, Anne and I constitute BWA. Um, we have been kicking around since 2008. We've been spending a lot of time talking about these things. We're now collaborating with Respect. Um, we help with the Respect group on Facebook, which is a support network. Uh, we're now in the process of, we've got the Mentoring Women in Archaeology and Heritage group, who are like the young, slightly less jaded <laughs> version of ourselves, slightly more positive in outlook, uh, which is great. But we're very much, uh, we've, very be we've been very keen to ensure collective working around these issues because we realised back in 2008 that actually the scope of this problem is such that it can't be tackled by a few individuals. This is about sector change, it's about culture change, and we need everybody involved. Okay, so hopefully we'll, we'll put some things on that whiteboard for you, okay? Ready? All right, so um, 2012, 2013, Profiling the Profession, the last Profiling the Profession, we haven't had that since this point. Um, we're very keen to ensure that that comes back. That gave us the figures that 46% of archaeology at that point was female, and it's projected that at the same rate by 2017-18, we would be dominantly female, predominantly female as a sector. Um, so we've been the fastest growing employee group within this sector for the last probably 10, 15 years, something of that nature. The question is, can we retain young women? Um, six, the six points that we're going to work through that BWA sort of coalesced around as, as the problems, if you like, and then towards the end of this, we'll talk about what we think the action points need to be. Uh, in 2010, we ran off one of our surveys. We found that one in two women had experienced workplace sexism. About one in three was seems to be the, the figure that, that ends up being central to all this. In 2014, Clancy et al, um, their figure was 40%. So there's somewhere in between 30-40% 30, 30, of all women are hearing inappropriate comments dealing with workplace sexism. So we're starting to get the data through now from a variety of of places that is supporting what we all feel on an individual basis. It's no longer um, simply, you know, uh, anecdotal. This is data-driven knowledge now. Um, of the one in two who had experienced workplace sexism, only 8% saw resolution. Only 16% reported, and this is something that we heard this morning from Jenny Andrew, who, you know, we're not reporting. We're in a sector that is in such a state of crisis around these issues, actually, that we, we cannot expect people who are uh, dealing with these issues to actually report them within the sector itself. Um, because 
we don't have a sector that's dealing with this. We have actually a failing system in this regard currently. Um, we've now got a situation where our first uh, legal case is in the courts around sexual assault at the University of Cambridge on a, an archaeological field school. So that's great, isn't it? Good promotional uh, material for our sector. Um, in 2019, BWA put itself forward as the place where the Me Too generation could come and report this stuff. Uh, we didn't intend to have a database. We've got a database because I couldn't actually physically retain all of the data, all of the cases that came forward. Within a year, this year, we've got 50 plus instances. <coughs> so I mean, I actually got women in their 60s coming forward to report historic cases of sexual assault and sexual harassment in the field. Some of these cases are very serious indeed. We think that this should be dealt with within the professional forum. It's not actually my job to, do, to be dealing with this stuff. I'm doing it because there's a gap professionally here. Um, we are starting to talk about resource around harassment and assault. We've got the fantastic Badge of Respect Guide, which is out there doing really good stuff. Um, CIFO, I did talk with um, CIFO representative last week and started to throw around ideas around to toolbox talks, induction sessions. Hannah's brilliant, you know, 10 point plan how to diversify the workplace. There's movement there, isn't there? Um, but I think what we're, we're all talking about is us equipping field staff with the tools with the, the knowledge that's going to help them deal with instances of sexism, not assault, but sexism in the field in the moment it happens. So we all need to skill up. We need to be challenging those behaviours because it's a spectrum of behaviour. And if we can challenge the stuff at this end, there'll be less of the stuff at this end. And I think we all like to see that. Okay, so number two, workplace harassment and assault. Two different things, actually, okay? And we need to start separating these things out. Number three, the economics of parenting. Huge, absolutely huge. We, as a sector, really have to start dealing with this issue because we are losing some of our best archaeologists around this subject, okay? I'm um, just looking at this graph here, two different surveys of ours, 2008 to 2016. It's reducing, you know, 90 plus percent in 2008 said that this was predominantly faced by women. It's, it's shifting slightly, but this is still largely a women's issue. And there's no need for this to be a women's issue. Um, the problem that we have is that in a society that isn't providing costs for childcare, it's always the less well-paid member of a heterosexual partnership who takes the fall for parenting. So we have a situation where the woman sacrifices her career because of the gender pay gap. Right, isn't it? So you fuck this way, you fuck that way. Anyway, whatever. The sex probably wasn't that good in the first place. Um, <laughs> right, career of family. So this is number four. This is separate. Again, this is the mechanics of parenting. Okay? So the fact that we are, we are in a mobile sector, we are largely moving between contracts, perhaps moving between units on a, a seasonal basis sometimes. Um, this is really, really difficult. 72% of the women that we spoke to in 2010 had no parent responsibilities. So we're self-selecting. The women in the sector aren't carers because we are not providing space for carers within our sector. 47% um, in 2010 believed they could not have a family and remain in our guilty. That's one in two. One in two young women think, I'm going to have to choose. I'm going to have to choose between the career I'm trained for, and a family. It's not good enough, man. Um, I have had to choose. I haven't had to choose. You know, this is, this is really bad. I can't underline 
how far behind we are as a sector on basic, you know, rights and provisions around this stuff. So what do we end up with? We've got a sector skills drain. Why are we bothering to train women in the first place if we're just going to kick them out when they get pregnant, effectively? What's the point? I mean, let's just not bother training women. Let's be, let's be bold about it. <laughs> And in fact, if I can just interject, can I get the, yeah. the mic? Yeah. Mm. I just want to say when we um, started doing um, these presentations, when we got the first lot of data, when the um, tuition fees were only £1,000, we were talking about it being theft, that it's effect effectively theft to get women in, to get them to imagine that they can do this. Now, with the costs that are involved in getting the first degree of you know, forty to £50,000, Things that they, you know, they're never going to repay that. They're never going to get the skills or the salary. It, it's really quite appalling on the economics. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Thank you. Um, okay, so that was number four: mechanics of parenting, childcare, that sort of stuff. Number five: we've got issue around promotion. The fact that promotion is gendered in our sector. Okay. Now the first thing we need to recognise is that promotion is not about performance anymore, if it ever was. It's not about qualifications, it's not about ability, it's about potential, and it's about characters that are perceived to be leadership qualities, okay? But it's not actually related to ability. So once you put a head around that, it makes life a lot easier. Um, just. Some basic stats there. I mean, we've got a lot of data on this in the academic sector. We are starting to ask for this data in the contract sector as well. Uh, 2010, 2016, has your sex had an impact on employment status or salary level? Does your sex affect promotion? Again, one in three women believe that their sex is directly related to promotion processes and their inability to progress as rapidly as contemporary uh, similarly skilled male peers. Number six, the pay gap. Obviously this isn't restricted to archaeology, but it is a major problem when we're already <laughs> dealing with a low wage sector, mobility, a contract, all that sort of stuff. We're talking serious amounts of money here, you know, and it's not just a pay gap, it's a savings gap, it's a pension gap, it's a leisure gap. This is, this is what affects our everyday life. Um, and you know, the Equal Pay Act was 1970. The year I was born. Yeah. So that worked. Economics and equity, sorry, did you see what I mean? We're jaded. Economics and equity. You know, this is not a women's problem. This is a sector problem. This is a professional problem. And I am fed up with it falling to the women in the sector to have to deal with this. We're not going to do this anymore. <coughs> this has got to be taken on by the institutions and it's got to be taken on now. Um, economically, it makes sense to have a sector that doesn't kick out half its best people five years after they've entered, six years after they've entered. Which, which other sector thinks that that's a solid economic strategy? <laughs> Like, honestly, it's, it's hilarious to me. Um, right, so that's all the problems. Lots of problems, lots and lots of problems. Action. One, we have to tackle the institutional sexism of our workplaces. This is a cultural problem and it can be changed. And we have to provide the skills and resources within the workplaces to ensure that that happens. And we will get to a zero tolerance on workplace sexism. We will achieve that, and we're going to do it quite soon. We need to be training our managers to rethink things like work-life balance and the impact that parenting has in the workplace and how we structure our workplaces around that. Active mentoring of women's staff, Sifa have suggested this could be a place that they step in. We've also got the biggest question about monitoring and enforcing this stuff. And this is something that we're all talking about, we're all having conversations about. <coughs> Literally, you know, over the past couple of weeks, this has really ramped up in pace. So these conversations are happening at quite high levels at the moment. 
it is starting to change. So tackling the institutional sexism. Secondly, survivor reporting and support that currently sits with BWA in respect. We want to see that move across to the professional sector. I don't think it's going to sit with CIFA, um, but that's something that's in transition. We need to be thinking about how we as a sector deal with what is a crisis of sexual harassment in our fields. And it's not up to a voluntary women's group to be doing that shit. Right? Number three, economics, mechanics of parenting. We need to be talking about part-time work, flexible working strategies. I think Sadie is having some really, Sadie Watson's having some really good um, strategic ideas about that. We, we're not talking about this, I think, what Jenny actually said this morning, that we can't tinker around the edges with this step. Okay, what we, as a collective group of people are now talking about is actually quite important, quite a radical change within the sector. That's what we're looking to. We're, we're, we're done. We've been saying this for decades now. We're, we're fed up saying it. This has got to be now radical change, central change. <coughs> um, for transparent pain promotion structures, so this is probably slightly more research based trying to work out the, the role, qualifications, um, role, uh, contract type, that sort of stuff, and work out where the problems in the discipline sit so that we can have a data-led strategy around tackling those. Um, and perhaps some proactive equality strategy in line with the gender equality charter mark so that there's a um, so that there's a motivation for the companies to actually make sure this happens. Uh, we lobbied CIFA on this in 2015, uh, hoping that they would take a leadership role in some of this stuff. I think it's becoming apparent, really, that that's not going to be possible. That's fine. Um, it's going to happen anyway. We're talking about things like the data gathering exercise, so profiling the profession. We need that to uh, be front centre, really. The fact that we've let that slip is really quite disturbing at this point in time especially after me too. Um, mandatory responses from units, establishing standards, providing resource, monitoring, police and enforcing. So we know what needs to happen, it's just actually ensuring that it does now. Um, one very simple issue, we need to end the skills drain by tackling paying conditions and gender equity. And that's actually been the case since the 1990s. Um, CIFA and the wider sector, we've actually known about that since the 1990s. This isn't new stuff. It's been around for an awfully long time. It's just, I think now we're at a point where we're going to start asking permission for change. We're just going to make sure the change happens. Okay, that's us. Rachel was told very firmly about the number of sides, and then I totally forgot to even count them. So oh, yes. <laughs> I was I was well worth the time. Um, well, thank you very much to everyone who's uh, provided a statement and who has um, read the statement. We have. What we're going to do now is actually just break. Uh, what time are we at? Yeah. So we'll come back at four. So about 15 minutes, obviously we won't actually start at 4 because we're never going to start on time. Um, but in that, in that time, uh, the organisers are going to come up with some targeted questions, which are going to be for the panel, and this will hopefully form the basis of what we hope is um, the action document that we really would like to come out of this, because Rachel can't give this presentation every week. Apparently <laughs> <laughs> she's busy. Um, some stupid archaeology thing? Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much. And um, when we come back, we will really hope to have some more comments um, from the audience uh, sort of as we go through these points. So please do come back and contribute. Just flash your hand up and we will oh, please go go copy something. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah, uh, if you don't want yeah.
All right, so is this, I was going to, I'm just going to put it for um, people's benefit so they can see who's talking with the Twitter handles, so it doesn't have to be on the screen. It's literally, it's literally just one slide, like, nobody needs to see it. Yeah. Do I need to hit a button? Mm. Sorry. Sorry. Awesome. There you go. Okay. All right. Um, just to say, for this uh, last part of the session, um, we, we, we are live streaming, so if anyone in the audience does not wish to be recorded, um, we will cut the live stream. So uh, I think um, you, you may need to signal that to the lovely human being who will come over with a microphone. Um, you, don't, you don't have to ask yourself now, no, so. Uh, we're also going to start recording there. Uh, where is my lovely tag parent? See, the nominated. Uh... Right, okay, so we only have an hour left to solve all of the issues in all of the world. I think we can do it. Um, so uh, I think we should try this. We have the unique opportunity to, um, to try. So let's, let's do it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of summarize a couple of the problems and a couple of the actions that I think uh, went with those. And I'd just like to go around and get a response in a sort of like one to two minute range, unless you need to say something, um, just on each point. And that, I hope, is going to be the backbone of the structure for the doc that we're talking about. Um, we, we will all get a chance to talk about this later uh, without the live audience. But, um, so the, the first point um, is, is, I think, this issue of gendered working and gendered roles. Um, this seems to be key to a lot of issues um, in terms of representation in senior roles, in terms of um, pay equity and the perception of things like part-time. We talked about um, emotional labor and stuff like community archaeology, and we talked about you know, the soft skills. That, by the way, no one pays for, um, and uh, you know the fact that all of us are doing all of this, and I wouldn't—not all of us are paid to do this. Turns out, um, and so, and then we turn to the actions that I, I think went with some of those problems, and those, those were um, basically how do we deal with this gendered division of roles within archaeology, um, and we had suggestions of basically monitoring, keeping an eye on the data. Um, you know, a data-led approach. 
uh, also mentoring. Um, and then we have a great suggestion for guests or prospects who are first to leave, but, um, which is also to know your rights, is to understand your legal rights in working and to myth bust. Um, you know, this, this perception that people have that you cannot be a parent in archaeology is, is pretty bad. Um, so, so the first thing I'd like people to just give us, what is the most important thing we can do to address gender roles in archaeology? And I'm, I'm actually just going to pass the mic down, and I'd like everyone to take one to two minutes to kind of just give us what do we need to do about this. Yeah. Uh, did you want to come in on this, or should we go straight to Susie? Okay. Oh, I'll pass the one as well. Okay. Um, so, um, yesterday I ran a um, post-human feminist session, and in that we talked about about this actually. We were talking about it in relation to, to previous human just as relevant to, to contemporary practice. We were talking about how, um, so Rob and uh, Ben Jervis, Ben Jervis was talking about um, uh, uh, like, uh, women's labour, uh, medieval women's labour being like, classified as like, kind of like a work, and yet it was fundamental to popping up all society. And there was a kind of a, 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 about Vikings, and she was saying, you know, Vikings are like these seafaring men, but she was making the same as the women. So, you know, that kind of uh, narrative. And, and I think maybe we, we could be informed by, by that kind of thing, but recentering the importance of these acts, uh, of these acts. Find, find sort of, it, and this goes back to the Joan Giro paper, uh, the home ideology, that we need to sort of re, re, recenter and reframe the way we talk about those kind of tasks as being central and complicated the archaeological process about women's work, you know, it, it's fundamental. And on that note, <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's um, also awareness, awareness within the profession that this is actually what's happening because I think you can go, you go into, into your career and you don't, it, it, I'm quite horrified that you know it's taken me a while to realise that I'm actually inadvertently probably being complicit in, um, in encouraging more women thinking I was helping by encouraging them to go into these, you know, the gender roles, go into fine work and fine specialisms, you know, rescue thing, um, without actually realising that's what I was doing. So, um, I think, you know, it's aware, raising awareness within the profession, and it's, it isn't just happening to, to any of them, um, you know, quite often, you know, really, I know a um, man who would have quite liked to have gone into fine work on the side, but they always be encouraged to go and do the heavy work on the medium on site and so they get pushed in one direction and then when they get pushed in another direction and you don't always at the time realise that that's what's happening. So I think you know just raising awareness and talking about it outside of conferences like this, you know, a lot of commercial archaeologists you know, probably don't go to conferences like this. So you know yeah, awareness and talking about it more. And from from my perspective, the, the way beyond the gender roles is to remove the barriers to equality. So that would be maternity rights and the structure of our working practices, so that we can be parents as well as archaeologists. And I think that one thing will open up things to everybody. I think the other thing that we can do is um, amplify the role of the specialists and the female gender roles in archaeology, which is including the soft skills. Um, and maybe we can take that into our workplaces in terms of challenging who's mentioned in publications, who's seen as being contributing to that. If we see projects going forward that are mainly male dominated, again, challenge that at the time and suggest people that might be involved. Because I think that. One thing we have also talked about is perhaps women waiting to be asked instead of putting themselves forward. And it's very difficult when you're suffering with rejection and all the other things that many of us do. Um, but actually, if other people can highlight it and speak for those issues, then I think that we, we can get better representation of the group. Um, okay, we should have a look. Yeah. So, yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I think what we need to do is start at the roots of where the perception is coming, which I think for a lot of people is actually really kind of pressure. Because no matter which sector you end up in, most people begin the students these days. You know, sort of just go straight into kind of shock or do you begin? And so I think it would be worth considering ways that. Um, explicit deconstruction of gendered career roles are actually made part of the, the teaching that goes on in the universities uh, as, a, as a baseline point um, and that that is, I mean people make an effort already to, certain people make an effort to have unfair representation on their reading list and things like this but I think actually it has to be explicitly discussed in terms of careers. I don't know what Sort of the typical undergraduate experiences in terms of career talks or what happens in the departments. Perhaps that's something we need to start actually doing. That's a mandatory part of being an undergraduate as you learn what the state of the profession is. Not to scare people up, like, you know, what are the options? How do we talk about things? What and ask them what they think. Mm -hmm. yes. <coughs> Just a, sorry. Just really, just really quickly, this is an anecdote. Um, on that. So, I had someone from the University of Manchester, and we we did a lot of nice career things and um, placements, blah, 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 all those things. And we do career talks, and um, obviously, it doesn't have quality of diversity issue to it all, so that's all great. So, we brought some people in from sort of the units to do talks about, you know, commercial work and then they also did kind of like their interviews for managers and master students to then you know and want to you know they submit their CVs and potentially their job. So uh, an amazing field archaeologist who is you know, person who's now an amazing field archaeologist and is a student of an amazing field archaeologist. Always an amazing <laughs> she went into the interview and she's uh, quite uh, slim and willowy and pale and uh, it was just just the person from the unit and her. And he said to her, it is going to involve doing lots of heavy work. Do you um, think you can pick up my bag? If you can carry my bag, then you can carry a total station. Let me tell you, this was two years ago, not quite in the 1970s. Uh, so so there's a, also those kind of, uh, <laughs> those kind of recruitment drives probably need a little bit of work too. Um, uh, that's a, that's <laughs> well, that was mildly depressing. Um, would, would anyone from the audience uh, like to come in with any points on that? Any comments there? There. Okay. Very, apparently, gender gender roles not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think you. Know, one of the, one of the, I'm, I'm adding an add-on to my, to my original question. Um, where is this enforced? So Becky has given us, um, at university level, when you're teaching and training the next generation, um, but Hannah's has then brought up the fact that, um, you know, even, even in this situation, the best will in the world, you know, it, there are people from units coming in who may not have had this helpful training in not judging. <laughs> Whether what it can do work or not, um, where where is the place uh, that we need to be focusing our efforts on to affect? So I know Rachel had a, you know um, another taking credit, which is actually it just needs to be absolutely down the line the equalities law that we need to be aware of working practice. So I'd just like to go around actually very quickly and just see if everyone thinks it is the training and the teaching, or if this is something that is an employment practice issue. And if so, where do we look at that? Is it university or is it in the unit? So I'm just going to run the mic really quickly back down. I said I think it has to start at the beginning. I actually would like to say that uh, societies can also play a role in this as well. And obviously being the only, well, second American on this panel, but <laughs> um, sort of representing, I'm on the Committee for the Status of Women in Archaeology for the Society for American Archaeology, but we just don't see even these sorts of panels um, and I think widespread sort of professional discussion of these issues, like, you know, well, we don't even have a union, so, um, like Prospect or, you know, SIFA, um, sort of bodies like that, um, that are maybe 
kind of considering these issues. And so I think the fact that these sort of fora exist here is really excellent. I think it is a part of the duty of professional societies to also um, be proactive in this because that's actually where a lot of graduate students that are maybe considering um, professional careers or, you know, sort of a variety of careers are also getting a lot of social cues and sort of deciding, making decisions about um, their careers. And so I think it's also, you know, important to think about societal kind of representation or messaging uh, as well. Uh, I think everyone has to do something. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I think like I said in my, my um, uh, uh, introduction piece, it's a cross-sector issue. <coughs> everyone has to, I mean, if we're still talking about specifically about like, sort of challenging gender roles, everyone has to be on that, otherwise it doesn't, doesn't work. So that's my ambitious, ambitious point. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm, thank you as well, I agree that it needs to start at the university. But I think we also um, need to be careful how we, you know, I think we ought to have these discussions with students about you know, careers in archaeology and their issues. And one of the things that came out this morning was um, a student saying how, how terrifying and depressing it all sounds and why are they even, why are they even thinking about entering the profession in the first place. And that's not the message either that we want to be giving out. So, I think we need to think carefully about how we frame these discussions and um, be realistic, but also you know, stress the positives as well. I think there are two unique places. One is the university, because we know that university training is a nation for the flash point. Um, but for me personally, you know, I, I run a field school, then students will go out into the professional sector and their first interactions with that they're leaving or they last if they manage to last the last couple of years and they're leaving so for me actually i think the energy the effort from my perspective from our perspective as big wa is about creating a profession and actually it's professional practice that we see you know one of our talks was are we a profession yet and i don't think we are so that would be where the energy from me. Hi, and just to add on to that, I think that we do want to empower students with the knowledge that they might have to fight when they go into commercial practice to have um, these, um, to be treated equally, um, whether they're female or again, whether they're enabled or, you know, when you know the, um, experiences from Hannah on a certain penny, and um, here Hannah. <laughs> Um, earlier. Um, but I think the other thing that we probably need to um, educate um, units and employers is that they're going to get sued. I mean, it really is illegal. And we, we are starting to see that, you know, with our people teachers. And that is it's only a matter of time before we start to see that happening in the workplace. So this isn't just a wish list, this is actual illegal practices that, you know, that kind of interview that you're a student at is exactly the kind of thing that we could end up in the So we can say this tomorrow. Yeah, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> so the happy end of the story is that she never worked for that company. Yeah. <laughs> Other companies have had her wonderful, amazing, wonderfulness, so that's good. Okay. Yeah, and just to add as well, like, you know, obviously, with my see that happen, you know, a professional body should be at the heart of all of this professionalism. You know that there's that, that as, as as Rachel raised, there needs to be leadership and I don't think we're there yet we're right, but a professional body is the, the, the place to, to, to set the standards for professionalism. That's what we the advisor council work the party are working for. Um, it's kind of, well, my final kind of comment for that, but it does link into the next broad thing that came out of the, the, the presentations earlier. So, um, clearly what's happening right now is that there is um, this collective action and the energy to move things and effects um, change is, is real right now. Um, and there was some interesting 
commonality in the idea of having horizontal power structures that was in the, in the film as well at the beginning um, and you know people staying in their autonomous zones of what they do but using a collective action and that is exactly what today is about um, and I think one of those things that collectively our voices could perhaps uh, effect change links to all these things that people have just suggested as ways to help with the basic issue about gendered work conditions and everything is um, how how as a collective group um, are we going to essentially ensure somebody gives us some money to do this because all of the ideas of life careers programs and perhaps having a legal fund for people who do want to sue operated by a professional body this all is going to cost money and until the cash is regarded by those in positions of power as worth well spending on this I can't see that actually there's going to be dramatic shifts other than requiring people to do it voluntarily as has always been I'll just quickly say that from like yes, we I'm internally have been asking CIFA for this, and certainly with the Equalities Collective, we can use an event, uh, you know, budget and, and event organising to to run that, and we can use budget. We can also work, you know, you know bring, bring those kind of funds in. Those aren't the specific funds to fund the Equalities Collective, but that's a start, and it's a push in the right direction. There is. There is there, there, you know, there may well be funds forthcoming from other places. So, say you were talking about potential funding from Prospect, and I think they are, are keen to contribute in, uh, as well. Um, although they don't feel it's my place to, to say it, uh, but, but I think that they're, that, they're, that they're willing to contribute. Is that okay to say it? They are willing to contribute, very keen to contribute money, and I think that, like, based on based on doing more research and and and, and being able to put funds in. So that's three sort of powerful bodies, and I think like those are kind of starting points that we can, can build on. And I think particularly the support of fame is really important because I think when other companies see that, and uh, as, then, then then they've got to step up. Um, and, and, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the same thing really that we, you know, we are saying this is a collective of women, but actually there is a desire now from the broader sector. So they, they've started to realise that uh, this is pretty serious. Um, there is actually a desire for change from quite a few of the big institutions now. We can also add to that society that increase is undergoing some quite radical change currently as a result of um, some things that have been in the last couple of years. Uh, CBA, obviously. Um, so, as a sector, the institutions have recognised that this is actually an issue and um, want to do something about it. And actually, the most proactive are the, the big employers. Yeah. So, you know, we have we have the strategy, we, we understand what's happening, we know what needs to happen, the employers are there with cash. Um, the question of leadership is, is vaguely important, but I think really now we just need to get on with it. Yeah. And I think we have a question. We from, have two. Uh, two. All right. yep. um, so I was really glad that uh, the professionals are doing it because it's so often that conferences only the academics have come up, but I wanted to talk about societies for a minute. Good question. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah. no, I'm fine. Um, I think one of the biggest problems with bringing up societies at this level is that most ECR women and most women in general in the field are actively being pushed across societies at this point. Um, like we saw with the SAAs this year, that was an absolute fucking trash fire. Sorry, I know that's on film, but it was. There's no other nice way to say it. And so the biggest comment, so uh, I was one of the people that was involved in the bylaws change for the SAA thing that was still an ongoing trash fire. Great way to start my PhD. Um, the only reason we had anything done at all was because we actively sent them harassing emails to, for them to answer us. And some of the most consistent comments we got when we had people signing things and responding to us about our language or our bylaws change were that basically unanimously ECR women no longer go to big conferences. And you're seeing this push of 
the younger side of the field, especially female, especially um, other minority populations, um, towards small niche conferences. <coughs> and while that may help where you study geographically, like I felt very safe going to Serta, and I feel very safe on this part of people, but I don't think I'll be going to, to Gasly's, <laughs> well, for different reasons. And I even feel uncomfortable with the idea of going to WAC because a few years ago at WAC, I brought up um, how to put this nicely. I brought up including disabled people um, in minority statuses for the lower fee, and their response was that I didn't look disabled. Basically, that was basically their response. Uh, my friend would tell me the rest of what they said because apparently that was the only polite part. So I think part of what we need to keep in consideration, where I think it's very important and the board, that, not board, but people you sit with the group on, is one of the only nice parts of, of the essay is left. Um, but I think we need to also consider that we might not have that macro access anymore to people going forward, because people are graduate, uh, gravitating more towards things like CAA, towards which I mean the computational meetings, not Canadian, <laughs> just because there are Canadians around. Um, and things like the frameworks, which Scotland does very well, and things like tag. Um, and just considering what we can do on a micro level that can reach the macro, because I do think we are going to see even more of a shift as we go forward away from ECRs feeling safe in those spaces. I do want to respond to that really quickly, if I can, Mike, because I agree. And, um, you know, I'll say I, I've been on that committee. This is just my first, this past day was my first oh, year on that no. committee. And the, you know, I mean, there's, we could, anyway, I don't want to get bogged into details on, um, you know, some of the possibilities, but also um, maybe setbacks or constraints that that committee has. But in terms of thinking about that, you know, you're saying that you feel uncomfortable going to a large conference like that. I'm, I similarly, I mean, I'm not going this year. And, but I think that also goes to show that this is a big problem because that is where a lot of this networking and a lot of this higher level, um, you know, sort of if you're not showing your face there, then who are you? So maybe you are going to these smaller conferences and you are getting a lot out of it. Certainly there's a lot more community feeling. Um, but then at the same time, if you're not at these larger conferences, what are you missing out on? You know, who's missing out on meeting you? And so in some sense, uh, you know, it is the society's fault. It's their responsibility to make sure that they're inclusive and, and making sure that it is an inclusive space for people to come and to be able to build their careers. Like, it is, um, I think, problematic, obviously, if, if then you feel excluded from a large society meeting. And so that's why I think the onus is on the societies to, to work on that. Yeah, and we have a second question to response to this first. Okay. Um, I just want to say that um, the inclusivity that is, you know, really apparent at the time conference is something that um, we've all been working with TAG for a really long time. So, um, Rich and I both um, launched BWA at TAG in 2008, and we did a baby TAG survey about having, about who wanted to bring babies to the conference. And then the inclusivity project that we were working on that was also a couple of years ago. Now, because I do the British Neolithic and Tim Darvill and a lot of people on the National Committee also do the British Neolithic, I'm networked with those senior academics already. And so I've been able to bring this conversation across the board through, through my contact with them already. So I think what we're seeing at TAG this year is absolutely brilliant. And I think that UCL is really do need supporting for really taking that one and bringing this a, a much different feel, you know, really, if you've gone to TAG 10 years ago, it really might not have felt like this. So this is, you know, we can work with these big societies is what I'm saying, but it, it is something, but it isn't something that's happening overnight. This isn't something that just happened. And I think we have a question. Oh, hello. Um, I'd like to say thank you for this panel. I think it's a really useful and interesting. Are you okay if you're on film? Yeah. Okay. Um, so first, thank you. And then uh, I'd like to say that I used to work in industry, and I appreciate the ability to have an action when something happens, if there is a sexist moment. And I was lucky enough to work for some amazing people. So my, you know, anecdotes of, of the 
less nice thing to her people that I worked with at some point nationally. But then I went into uh, doing my PhD and I was basically subjected to non-stop bullying and from someone, and it wasn't just me, and the university as an industry protected this person for years. And we were able eventually to do something about it, but it was absolutely horrific for more than myself for years before me. I'm pretty sure a few careers got ruined or we were able to stop this bullying. And the problem here is that you're talking about actions like suing, and then eventually companies will realize that they'll have to take responsibility or they'll get sued. The universities are behind the wall and they are shut down, turn inwards and protect the students. So what do we do about that? <laughs> that's actually that's um, a, a really good um, introduction. Yeah, so that's a really good introduction to I think the, the next point I want to start to, which is about reporting and actions in the case of harassment. And I can see that we have a point over here. So let me pass this right. I think this is a really important point actually because this is where the culture change has to happen. So we have had generations of sweeping under the carpet around these behaviours. And um, that has to shift. And I think the only way we can assist that in shifting is through actions of public shaming. Because that is all they want to respond to. So the processes themselves currently designed not to facilitate survivors, they're designed to protect staff. And when that's made visible, when it's made visible to parents, particularly in a fee-paying world, that is what facilitates change, is transparency and public shaming of these institutions who are protecting the perpetrators. Can I, can I just say that what... So the university has a way I've seen this paperwork before of making people decide if they want to if they want to complain, then the university shuts down their ability to publicly shame someone. Because then it undermines the case the university is making against this bully, apparently. And so you aren't allowed to publicly shame or you don't get your that, that's the question I was gonna ask is you know, can, can can you give us some tangible ways to name and shame? Like without I mean do you does what, what's the law? What's the, we know the law in terms of the Equality Act, but then we can see the defamation. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not scared of that. I'm not scared of that. I'm not scared of that. I mean, I think Dami's case at Cambridge is a, is a really important one. And I think we have to work, work through this, but we've seen that the, the internal processes are actually not working. And I'm correcting, you know, in Dami's case, we're actually contributing to the trauma around what happens here. So they don't really fit the purpose. Um, we can't continue to support that environment where young women who have the, the energy, the bravery, the courage to come forward and report are actually re traumatised through our systems. So we have we have to challenge that. We have to publicly challenge it. So are you saying are you, are you saying like you know through through social media, through calling out like the, the yes, the thing is really the fact that he was named, and that was really clear. And like, it was the fact that that was named by someone who was actually out, you know, um, what's that, the, the journalist guy who then got kicked out and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Not him. He's also a terrible oh, person. But yeah, <laughs> no, no, but, but, but it was useful. He wasn't anyone in the profession, was it? But he was kind of like an external person. He was an external person. Actually, there is a whistleblower service. There is a whistleblower service that CFA is subscribed to. Um, uh, no, I'll look them up while you guys talking. And if you're if you work at an RO or you're a member of CFA, can you report the call? I'll look them up. Then you can go directly to that whistleblower service if there's a problem. I might get on my 10 steps thing. I'll try some CFA. And and I think that. So just to go back to what's happening in universities. In, as, you, as you said in your, in, in, um, your example, there are, people know about this and they, they have covered it up over a long period of time within institutions. And part of, I think, this culture change is having people within these institutions begin to 
really feel ashamed of that themselves. So it's really hard for women to come forward, and I think that a lot of women who are coming forward to work to us are doing so because they know we're sitting outside the, the structures. Um, you know, we're not a formal body, we're not affiliated with anyone, and we can keep things secret, and so they can talk to us. Um, but within in university environments, you're absolutely right. I think, though, that Danny's case at Bradford, uh, sorry, at Cambridge is really going to change things. A lot of universities are looking at that. I find that the, the case of sexism, so bullying is a bit different. It can apply to many more, it's not so gendered. And so I find sexism is getting much more of a, after Me Too, and much more of a response. And people are taking more actions and things like that. But when you get bullying, it's, yeah, a range of people. Mind that the hatching is even so I, I'd like it because we will we will slowly run. Did you did you have one more? Was there? Moving microphone. Let me just quickly say that whistleblower charity they're called Protect, uh, and so if you're a member of CEO, you can contact us. Um, then you need to speak to an external uh, and confidential third party. So that's so, we can go to. so this, this will be our answer. Right. So we have uh, one in the in the back in the red. Maroon? Yeah. Um, Are you okay to be on Yeah, yeah. Uh, I feel like I need to come in with a non cis um, survival sort of angle in this. Um, also, from a student perspective, from the experience I've had of having to report things on my friends, having to report incidents either of sexism or harassment or transphobia or homophobia or whatever, is the best case scenario is you're asked to join the Equalities Committee, which is not, I don't, I'm busy. Um, <laughs> but also, uh, I've already been traumatised, I don't want to, like, obviously I want to help people, but also I'm upset and... You didn't want to do free labour? No, I didn't want to do free labour, so it anyway, because I'm a student. So, um, but also, it, what it's taught me is they only will let you shame someone if you're more useful than them, which I know sounds awful. Yeah. But especially as a disabled student, if something crap happens to me, often it, like it's pushed aside because I'm just a student and I'm not like doing anything huge. You know, I'm not bringing in money or whatever. So it's not as important. And people also don't say that, but it's become apparent watching other people's cases as well that if you're not important, then they don't care. That's not a question. I just wanted to... Uh, that's, that's extremely... And I, I, I think actually because I want to get a last final statement from the panel actually on exactly... Uh, I don't know where the mic Sorry. I'm pretty loud. I'm American. Um, so I, what, what I want to actually do is... Because I think this is now centering in on one of the uh, really critical issues which I know Rachel and Anne have been dealing with very first hand, which is this issue of when it comes to a crisis point, when it comes to... We have absolute failure in reporting. We, we do not have a system that works. We do not have a system that works um, even within a single sector, let alone cross sector. I know Hannah's just brought out the, the whistleblower service, but it's, you know, if, if you're in this unit, but not that unit, if you're not in the union, if you're in the, you know, we do not have a system for this, um, let alone one that is fair and open and transparent and arbitrary. And so I'm actually just going to go right around. And I, I'd actually, what I want to know is, where is this reporting system best located? And I just want, I just want a very quick your thought on this. And then um, we're actually going to have a slightly more interesting present presentation, but um, if the panel are willing to stick around for a little bit and, and take some extra questions, we can, we can hang out here for a second. Um, but I just want to go around and, and just say, uh, who do we report to to fix this <coughs> stuff? Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I, a response from everyone is fine. That's just coping. Um, just put the microphone off. <laughs> um, I think it has to sit outside of um, profession as a as a academia, and and I have approached this receiver before, and they they don't feel like they're the people to do it, but. One of the things from the from the cross sector meeting back in July 2018 as well is this feeling that you can't report necessarily within your organisation because we're a very close profession. There's lots of relationships within organisations. I remember one 
instance and they wanted to report but they couldn't feel they could report to their HR officer because she was the wife of the person who was harassing them. So um, I think, and I, I don't know who, in, in my mind, I'd like to see um, an external body or a, or a, or a person or, or somewhere that anybody in working in the commercial sector or in the university can contact them and say, this is what's happened, get it recorded, get it logged, and then be sign boosted to where they need to go for the next steps. Um, but then you have one central point where all that information is also being um, being locked and being held so that then you can start to see patterns and does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I just <laughs> 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 In that cross sector meeting, one of the things that we talked about is whether we could have some kind of um, Athena Swan equivalent for our theology. So, uh, a kind of like um, you know, gold standard that people <coughs> aspire to. There is already external schemes like investors in diversity, and my understanding is that after the cross sector meeting, Wessex went away and talked about that, and they help you do an equality. Uh, Obviously, diversity audit within the workplace. Um, in, in, if you're commercial, if you're working in academia, and you've got the theme sports, so on, which is the same kind of thing where you have an audit of your workplace practice, and it carries weight. People want to get involved, and hardly anyone ever does because you know, like it, it's actually really hard. And there was an appetite for that expressed in that concept of meeting, but there's there's no one to run it, and if I. I toy with the idea all the time, all the time, of thinking, should, should I just set that up? Should, should I just, obviously not just set it up, because it would have to be a charity or a business, or I don't know, I think I need to talk to the Women's Mentoring Heritage for some, uh, for some advice on, on it. But I sort of think that that could also be that same, but I don't know, could it also be the same kind of place where A, it's for reporting, and B, it's for setting, monitoring, auditing standards and quality and diversity. Uh, um, I think that's a quite a lot of work. I also really, really love teaching and doing that. That's 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 I was so, um, real quick, you know, film, but do you want audio? Audio is fine. Okay. Um, I was at that July 2018 meeting, and it was really hard for me because one of the things I've been about a lot since that is CFA's attitude, and I'm separating CFA EMD from central CFA. And I found the central CFA attitude. Yeah. This is probably a shocking at that meeting, and we could spend a lot of time talking about that, but I won't. Um, but I think they have a registered archaeological organisation system. That's the place where we need to be reporting. I think they have to step up and take responsibility for that. They really, really do. Um, I, I have had those conversations as well with, with CIFA and. Um, the, the line I got was, um, you know, they're not a trade union, they're, not, they're, they're very clear on their on what they consider their boundaries to be and they didn't feel that that was their remit. And I'm not convinced that that's the case, actually, but I think you need to say pushing that. Yeah. 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 This, yeah. So for us, bear in mind that we're at a critical point, if we were at a critical point and we actually need fast action on these matters at the moment. Um, I had a, a preliminary talk for uh, a representative from CFA and there is movement there and I think a lot of that is largely to do with the E&D group and it's, it's been really um, influential in shifting attitudes within CFA Central and that, I think that really needs to be appreciated how, how far things have moved in a very short period of time because of that work. Well, and also they know, they know about everyone else. <laughs> that's, that's true, but I, I, I think it's actually worked really, really well in that sense. Um, I think we 
have thought for the last year or so, few years actually, four years, that yes, this is our professional. <coughs> Gosh, it's a chartered institute. Shouldn't we be looking to them for guidance on professional practice? And yes, that's what we thought too. I think it's becoming apparent to me that we can't look to them necessarily for the leadership on this. That's not a problem. It's a positive that we're bringing them with us. And I think we can all do this collectively. But I think actually Kate is, is, is where I currently sit on this point, that it needs to be independent. It needs actually to sit outside of the structure. It needs to be collective so that it's cross-sector because we fall back again and again to this problem where if a unit isn't in our role, we don't have possibility for action. So I think we should be taking, you know, we've got that reporting system up and running. What I think Anne and I would like to see is that it's no longer the responsibility of the women's group, but I'm quite happy for that to move towards a cross-sector independent group where that work is recognised and then actually action that comes out of that into sectoral practice. So I think that what we want to be saying at this point is that um, a lot of the reports that we're getting are historic and they're not current. And I think that um, if anybody's experiencing um, harassment on their phone, um, I, two years ago, maybe a year ago, I started getting dick pics and I'm on dick pics and I don't know what to do. And I've given my number out, I don't know who are the projects. So um, I went on a closed Facebook group and um, I phoned the police, I phoned 101. The police response happened, everything was sorted within two hours. So they tried to phone the number of this guy, so basically this guy changed his number, I got this number, he got another number, did it from there as well. I gave them both numbers, they phoned him, left messages saying do not do this again, they sent, they then followed that up with text messages that would happen after a few days, and I think after a week, that this is a police text, do not continue to send this offensive material, you know, to this number. And so even with that kind of harassment over the phone, it is possible to report it to the police in the UK using the 101 number, and they are incredibly receptive. And basically, within two hours, this had been sorted, I changed my phone number, and I just moved on. So if something is happening, it is worth reporting it to the authorities because this is illegal. So I'm sorry, I feel like I'm the, like, I am like the sledgehammer at the end of the table. <laughs> so if something is happening, if it is assault, if it's physical assault, then that is something that should be reported to the authorities because it's really not okay. And anything else that we're talking about in terms of um, bullying and these other kinds of behaviours, they should have those conducts in place at your own employer where you can raise that with your supervisor. <laughs> Hmm. Uh, we are quite close to our time, yeah, but I wanted to make two points. One was um, the issue about who takes responsibility, basically, for the problem. And as has been stated, we do have a professional standards body. Um, if they don't want to actually host this, they should certainly pay for it. Whoever <coughs> hosts it, and I think that comes down again to the sound golden giver. Someone has to pay for it, we have to stop having to do everything voluntarily. And I think the professional body, actually, that is their role. When well, this is about professional standards and behaviour and safety, when it comes back to Sarah Main, and this is about culture change, about safety, health and safety. This is health and safety. This is their job to fund sorting this kind of thing out. So that's one thing. Um, I think, because we're, what are we? Okay. Um, I think everyone can sort of maybe finish with a point, but I wanted to bring in somebody who's been waiting very patiently, um, and it kind of connects with what we've, what we've been talking about in many ways. Somebody earlier mentioned how do we bring the micro into macro, how do we change culture, how do we change perceptions, um, and the example of the way that TAG has changed and as a culture. There are micro actions that have 
Subsequent to what you've done um, is the development of um, a really important pack which is all about normalising health and um, all these aspects. I'll give you the mic. Hi. Oh, this works. Um, so I'm Amy, um, and one thing that I've done is I've been part of a fantastic team who created a mentoring group for women. Um, trans, LGBT, fully inclusive um, across archaeological heritage. The principle being is that, you know, the class, um, you know, is that it's somewhere safe for people to turn around and say, hello, yes, hi, I have an issue, I have a problem, and we can signpost, we can direct, we work really closely with all the amazing panellists here. Yeah, we are young, we are new, uh, but the group has grown to 700 members in a year. And one of the big things that we've done is, and there's a reason why I've got some tampons around, is we've created this actually really smug, because uh, this is really cool, uh, the Seeing Red campaign. Uh, so some of you may have seen this go on viral. Uh, I woke up this morning and it's everywhere, which is a bit crazy. Um, and what it is, is it's a free downloadable guide. Um, if you're members of either Respect or Mentoring, it's already up on there. If not, uh, Come give me your email and I'll make sure it gets sent out. And it's downloaded, it's downloadable, and it's fully inclusive with enabled LGBT women. And it's a way of getting out this discourse saying, let's make periods a thing. Let's reclaim our bodies, let's reclaim our bodily functions, our bodily fluids. This is what our body is going to do. It's a perfectly natural state. And, you know, to help me, you know, you know, Keep, the, keep women, keep LGBT in archaeology, let's tackle the periods, let's start talking, you know, periods, period, full stop. Uh, so, what we've done is we've advised creating these period packs, a bit of a plug here, um, and, you know, it's in that should be out in every single field excavation survey, whether it's outreach, community, voluntary, academia, anything. And essentially, it's just used as first aid kit. So, if you need a tampon, there's a tampon. If you need a pad, there's a pad. If you're a moon cup user, great. Sometimes you still need a pad. You know, it's one of these where it's just, it's there for anyone who wants to use it. You know, we've got wet wipes in here, we've got tissues in here. If there's no running water, you can use the pack just to clean your hands. You know, it's just, I think the pack up front for the box of tampons, the box of pads, and the, uh, the case itself costs 12 pounds and it's less than six pounds to keep replenishing. In the welfare budgets, that is nothing. You know, it's in health and safety laws that sanitary facilities have to be provided. You know, so I can just turn around and say, you as employees, you as people, this is what you can demand. These are your rights, this is your body. You know, and as well, it opens up then this discourse and employees turn around and go, oh, okay, shit, we have to do this. So yeah, so definitely come and yeah, say hi. I'm in the big just stand downstairs. And yeah, let's get discourse flowing. Yeah, let's <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> I'm sorry, not. Um, so, so yeah, so that's yeah, I'm Amy. Uh, I am the period person at the moment. And yeah, the Seeing Red campaign, it's free, you yeah, because our periods should be free. You yeah, know, it's you yeah, give me your emails and I'll uh, get some stuff sent out to you. So thank you very much for inviting me to uh, to plug this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's basically going to be to end on an optimistic, people are doing things kind of note. I think that is the best possible way. Um, I would also like to mention that uh, we did think that uh, Laura Hampton was available. She's not, so sorry, her name is up there. But um, in case you were wondering where she was, sorry, she's not here. Um, but I'd really like to thank um, an amazing, uh, we, the conveners for giving us the opportunity to come and uh, and talk and, and the beautiful film which I thought was um, just a, a really nice chance to think about things in quite an in-depth way and of course for our panelists who have done this a lot who are forced to do this because the situation isn't fixed yet but I'm really hopeful that if we do this together often enough 
we can stop doing it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal. Uh, um, yeah, I don't know if anyone wants a final word. Um, right, okay, so we're, oh, sorry, so yeah. Yeah, okay, just, um, yeah, just to say thank you so much, everyone on the panel, for sharing your experiences, your stories, your thoughts, your ideas, what we can do. I'm really excited. I think it's going to be really good. Um, thank you for coming as well. Um, and I guess finally, I think we really want to turn this, as we said at the beginning, into kind of practical action, practical next steps. There's a lot going on, there's a lot happening, and it's quite an exciting time. Um, if anyone wants to be involved, I guess come and talk to anyone here, or myself and Beth, um, if you want to leave with your contact details, um, and see you as well, and um, leave your contact details and be part of a kind of ongoing um, production or discussion, then um, yeah, if you like, just thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, of course, for our uh, amazing audio visual. Thank you to Fame and to Doug uh, Rochelle, who has uh, um, uh, done amazing things with the live stream and the PowerPoints and the films and everything else. But um, yes, thank you very much, and uh, hopefully, we will have a little bit.